Hi everyone, my name is Sarah. And my name is Nesma. And we're Open Web Fellows with Mozilla this year, working on issues of uh, open internet, uh, data privacy, data security, and everything else in between. Literally everything else in between. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, facial recognition. So I think it's important for us to just define it. Facial recognition is a system. Uh, facial recognition systems is a technology capa uh, capable of identifying or verifying a person from the digital image or a video image um, or video frame from a video image. Um, and facial recognition is actually quite accurate. Uh, really? Is it? Most times, you have to often be like a white guy in that <laughs> oh, situation. Okay, got it, got it. Cause like Snapchat doesn't work really well for me, but you know, for some folks it does. So as Nesma said, facial recognition works really well if you are a white man. Um, and we've seen a lot in the news uh, over the past few years, a lot of incidents such as this one, where East Asians are recognized or incorrectly identified as having closed eyes when in fact they were not. So that's one of them. Oh, or the popular Google photo scandal, uh, where Google was tagging photos of black people as gorillas. Or HP's face tracking software that could not recognize black faces, but could only track white faces. You should definitely check out that video. It's hilarious. Basically, there's a really big lack of diverse data sets uh, to train machine learning models. So these incidents kept popping up in the media, and company after company kept getting ridiculed online uh, for incidents such as the ones that we just saw. And there's a lot of them that happen. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the universal and typical response to something like this is, is to be like, oh, we need more inclusion, we need more diversity in data sets, like capital D diversity. Um, and a few groups have actually popped up to like tell people essentially that you need to have diverse data sets, you also have to have like diverse staff members to make these tools better. Um, but like, are we sure we really want that? Do we, sure? do we want more diversity? I don't do know. We, well, I don't I mean, maybe, sure. maybe we don't want more diversity. I think, I think <laughs> diversity works. Like, I think if we're included, like, lots can happen. Well, let me tell you something. That's okay. Not. Cool, okay. Cool, cool. Uh, the, collection, <laughs> the collection of data um, actually has a dark side. And it's not the first time that technology has been used to reinforce systems that are already biased and already racist. So predictive models have been used by courts for years to determine bail and sentencing for the prison system, essentially weighing in on matters of um, freedom, captivity, life and death for a lot of people. And the truth is uh, that surveillance is just going to keep getting more and more pervasive and intensive, and it does predominantly affect uh, communities of color and marginalized groups. So it becomes really difficult to celebrate the improved effectiveness of a technology that just automates surveillance. But I want a Snapchat. No? I want a Snapchat. Well, when it comes to surveillance, like I said, communities of color, actually, in Asma, let me say, uh, are already over, overly surveilled, and that's been the case um, for hundreds of years. And technology is applied in all kinds of ways to reinforce these systems that are already biased and racist. So when we introduce facial recognition into the equation, while it can be applied to Snapchat and really awesome filters, uh, it can also be used uh, for surveillance. This is already happening um, for, from companies such as Geophedia uh, that law enforcement uses to basically um, tap into the API of social media sites. Um, and then track people's photos and cross-reference that with uh, facial recognition software to basically protect the public during, ri during riots or protests, uh, such as what happened during the Freddie, Ga Freddie Gray protests. And it's also being introduced in police body cameras, and this is an article from two or three days ago, actually, where facial recognition technology is being introduced in the body cameras that police are wearing. Um, actually, there's a <clears throat> there's actually a really great coalition right now that's fighting back against that. So it's important for us to recognize that not everyone is for this kind of diversification of data um, and the use of facial recognition um, on body cameras. So there's a really great uh, coalition that you should definitely follow. And I think you know I think about this quote quite a bit. And the reason why I think about it is in the process of constantly fighting for inclusion, like oh we really want to be included. I promise. Like I want the Google Arts app to be able to recognize my face. What's the art that looks like me? Um, you know, I think it's important for us to recognize that these systems weren't meant for us to begin with, right? We're thinking as a, like black and brown folks, they're not 
This is not meant for us. And often it's used against us. So do we want to support the development and implementation of tech that allows existing power structures to continue to surveil um, heavily policed communities? Uh, the liberation of black folks and all oppressed peoples will never be achieved with the inclusion um, in systems controlled by capitalist elites uh, who actually benefit from perpetual racism. Um, it can only be achieved by the destruction of those systems. And so that's why Audre Lorde's quote right here, the master's tool will never dismantle the master's house is important because in these conversations about like talking about uh, you know having diverse faces so that you can make sure that your machine like so it actually works better um, in detecting black people is often going to be used against us and we know that because it's historically been used against us so why would it all be, why would it change all of a sudden and I think about this Beyonce <laughs> gif or gif whatever you want to call it um, because I actually think that we don't need to be included in any of these systems. I think that it's a farce. I think it's a lie. Um, and despite every disadvantage, we must reappropriate oppressive technology for emancipatory purposes. I think we actually have to build our own tools. Uh, I know most people would be like, oh, but the facial recognition software will be, will be used for like healthcare technology. Yeah, but it could be used for other things as well. And you know, we often find all these reasons to mitigate issues instead of abolishing the system set in place. And I think it's important, the reason why we're bringing this up is, is also because like, you know, we're talking about algorithm impact assessments, we're talking about diverse data sets, you know, from data sets like LGBTQ data sets being used to like see if their face can, you know, identify them as queer or gay or label them as such. Um, it's important for us to be like, hey, Let's stop mitigating and let's actually like let's let's abolish it completely and making sure that that's actually an option for us. And so uh, Nabil Hussain actually wrote this really wonderful piece um, about uh, against black inclusion and facial recognition, and essentially says that the struggle for liberation is not the struggle for diversity and inclusion. Um, it is a struggle for decolonization, reparations, and self determination. So when we're thinking about hey. We really want our faces to be used. We really want us to be recognized in these systems. We must understand that this is not for us. And I keep reiterating that because it's really easy for us to constantly think about mitigating risks and not actually thinking about abolishing it. And so I, I often think about, for example, Stop LAPD. Um, when the stories came out about uh, predictive policing, they actually were like, what do you mean mitigating risks? <laughs> they were like, just shut it down completely. And they were right. And so you know, I know it's not often the easy route to say just shut it down, but I think it's important for us to constantly think about the ways in which we can do that, because we know that we're constantly being surveilled, and especially from corporate surveillance, that uh, these tools getting better is not gonna, like I would rather Snapchat not see my face and like have a crappy like variation of where the filter is if it's actually better for me. Um, and so I think that it's important for us to, to really look at the work that we do, and are we mitigating or are we abolishing? So thank you so much. Please don't include us. Please don't I, include that's us. Why yeah, that's actually why we said please don't include us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. OK, hello. Um, my name is Julia Cott, and I am a student at the College of William & Mary in American Studies. Um, my research focuses broadly on sexual consent in the digital age. Um, and in this talk, I will be examining the attempt to collectively narrativize experiences of sexual assault through the hashtag MeToo movement and think through some of the things the movement both obscured and revealed online. Um, as April mentioned, please feel free to step out at any time during this talk if you feel uncomfortable for any reason. Um, so the hashtag MeToo itself was started by a black activist, Tarana Burke, 10 years ago. On the website of her organization, Just Be Inc., there's some information written about the goals of Burke's Me Too movement. The movement is to give young women, particularly young women of color from low wealth communities, a sense of empowerment from the understanding that they are not alone in their circumstances. When it reemerged recently, it was distinctly not centering the intersections of marginalized identity that Burke's work had been. A tweet by actress Alyssa Milano in October 2017 read, Suggested by a friend, if all the women who have been sexually harassed or assaulted wrote Me Too as a status, we might give people a sense of the magnitude of the problem. The 
fact that the mainstream public started to pay attention to accusations of sexual assault when it was white and famous women speaking out is especially visible in the history of this hashtag. As we know, Milano's tweet came in the context of a wave of accusations from prominent celebrities against people like Harvey Weinstein. That October, the hashtag me too started popping up everywhere in my various news feeds with people publicly sharing an experience of sexual violence. One point of the exercise to demonstrate the sheer number of people who have been survivors of sexual violence did have an effect on some, including a friend's male coworker who said, I knew it was common, but I've never been so confronted by this issue and it's really making me think. Great, I guess. Why is it that some people, possibly many people, do not feel safe, comfortable, or that their experiences are even included under the hashtag MeToo? To be able to post the hashtag required an ability to name. It required an ability to claim something as someone's own, and I wonder about those who do not feel up to the task. To name violence is not a neutral activity and has historically been a way of keeping power in the hands of the most violent and the most powerful. Dr. Patricia Hill Collins, black feminist theorist, writes on this saying, definitions of violence lie not in acts themselves, but in how groups controlling positions of authority conceptualize such acts. We see this to be true in the total lack of accountability when police murder, assault, and abuse black people as compared to the privileging of white bodies within the justice system. Under the hashtag of Me Too, it was easy to call certain experiences violent and inappropriate while at the same time disregarding others as not relevant. As rapper Cardi B said in reference to the movement, a lot of video vixens have spoke about this and nobody gives a fuck. I bet if one of these women stands up and talks about it, people are going to say, so what? You're a hoe, it don't matter. Cardi B makes clear that when certain people speak out or possibly post hashtag me too, if it doesn't accord with white supremacist understandings of what counts as violence, it is much less likely anything will be done. Because of Milano's emphasis on women in her original tweet, the viral hashtag became used most prevalently to describe sexual assault and harassment experienced by the cis female body. Jay Dodd, a black trans femme poet, wrote a series of tweets on October 16th, 2017. They wrote, honestly, the resurgence of sexual assault conversations has just made me dysphoric and suicidal because there just isn't meaningful language being used. It's centering certain women when assault is about power first. There is nothing lost from transcending the gendered conversation. Growing up a black boy, in quotes, the access women, especially older, especially white, had over my body completely undermines this forced narrative. Honestly, the only thing worse than being a victim is feeling like you don't deserve your story. In some cases, this kind of collective narrativizing of experience emphasizes a solidarity, erasing rather than paying attention to the gendered, classed differences that can resist collectivization. We can look again to Dr. Patricia Hill Collins to think about a more inclusive model of understanding how violence works in our society. Collins writes, it may be more useful to think about violence as dynamic and highly contextual. Thinking about violence in this way allows us to begin to shift focus away from a singular kind of victimhood. The allowance for Me Too to include experiences of physically violent assault and threatening behavior made a clear connection between ranges of violent experiences. The hidden violence of everyday life, violence that occurs on the walk to work or in the home became briefly visible. What was lacking was an awareness of the social positioning of the people posting about these situations. The internet attempts to provide a cover of relative safety, but it also helps to mask racial and social positioning that creates and defines the context, or and defines the nuances of violent experiences within the context of the United States. 
One example of an experience that did not fit into the narrative of Me Too, but still became part of a mainstream conversation, was the short story Cat Person by Christina Rupenian. Cat Person, a New Yorker short story about a white college student named Margot, who goes on a date with an older man named Robert, goes back to his place and realizes she doesn't want to have sex, but has sex anyway because she feels pressured. Blogger Ella Dawson calls this bad sex. The sex we have that we don't want to have but consent to anyway. I find Cat Person interesting because it subtly pushes the boundaries of what may or may not be included under the hashtag MeToo and whether this bad sex may or may not be understood as violence. Looking at Margot's experience in Cat Person, Margot seems to freeze up at the prospect of vocalizing her own desires. <clears throat> then he was on top of her again, kissing her and weighing her down, and she knew that her last chance of enjoying this encounter had disappeared, but that she would carry through with it until it was over. Margot attempts to claim agency over her own body, but ultimately is unable to. She gives up control and gives into providing this man pleasure. The story ends with Robert texting Margot, calling her a whore. This serves to demonstrate the slippage between uncomfortable sex and potential violence. Robert's final text comes after the sexual experience, thereby disrupting the idea of a linear continuum of sexual violence. The non-linear and non-fixed nature of violence is important to recognize and hold space for. Margot may not have posted Me Too with reference to her experience with Robert, but talking about the varied interpretations of the kinds of violences people experience helps to de-objectify the self. This kind of dissonance, dissonance as post-structuralist feminist Sharon Marcus writes, conceives of sexuality not as a discrete object whose violation will always be painfully and instantly apparent, but as an intelligible process whose individual instances can be reinterpreted and renamed over time. Repenian shows us how the social scripts force, how social scripts can force people to act in ways that seem nonsensical or contradictory, that saying yes doesn't always mean yes, and thinking no doesn't always mean rape. One note, though, is the overwhelming whiteness and straightness of cat person. <clears throat> Indigenous Australian writer Evelyn Orlin wrote for Overland.org, I won't lament another useful dissection of contemporary white middle class gender politics if that is the effect of the text, but I won't be told to relate to it. Roxanne Gay tweeted that she wasn't the right demographic for the story. As a text that went viral for its relatability, it is important to note the presence of whiteness that serves as a neutralizing background for a sexual encounter. The fact that both of the people involved were white, the sexual encounter was heterosexual, vanilla, and occurred in a home means that it falls well within Gail Rubin's charmed circle, or the kinds of sex that are considered normal and good by dominant culture. The story pushes back against a certain heterosexual sex script and it is useful to recognize, and it is also, but it is also useful to recognize the social positioning of the characters as part of that maneuvering. From my perspective, Me Too revealed many important aspects of sexual violence while at the same time concealing differences. I know these differences can begin to be recognized if we pay attention to the nuances underneath the umbrella of a hashtag. Thank you. So we're downloading some slides. We appreciate your patience. Yes. So in the meantime, while those slides are downloading, does anyone have any questions for our first two presentations? Yes, in the back. I was curious on your opinions about uh, the recent use of uh, genetics for the conviction of the Golden, <laughs> Golden State Killer and its application um, to people of color and its future use. <laughs> this is being recorded, so um, yeah, I think commercial genetic testing is a scam, but that's my thing, so I personally don't believe in that stuff, so like 
I I think if I'm not wrong in that case though, it was like an open source. Like I think it wasn't. It was there. There's something. It wasn't like the popular 23andMe or Ancestry.com that was responsible for that. I think it was like another platform. Um, and I think there's something that we have to constantly recognize. And this is like data just pri data privacy stuff, but. Um, when law enforcement, like I think it's important for us to know that law enforcement, if they subpoena or try to access data sets, like what company you're actually trusting with that information. Um, there's a case that, of that in regards to like, I'm from Toronto and we have something called Presto Car. There's like a digitization of like public transit cards and the law enforcement like want to access essentially like someone's movement. Um, and no one knew that was even possible. Like, I don't think anyone had even read through the data privacy rules. And so I think this is just like another reminder about how um, like the legal systems, especially like police officers, are able to access data. And so like how do we control where we place our data? Um, because and like how do we also push for you know for-profit corporations are going to be doing this anyways? Like how do we push for them to like not accept? The subpoena or like fight back against it. Um, but I personally don't believe every time I see 23andMe stuff, I'm like, oh my God, I feel like it's gonna be used like very, it's gonna be really scary. But that's my case. I'm thinking about something like that or the Facebook transparency report. Um, Facebook often gets uh, subpoenaed by the by law enforcement to get to get access to information on people's profiles, and it's usually because law enforcement is investing investigating a case. Um, and there's always a legitimate reason, the same way that there was a legitimate reason for um, asking for that information from the uh, whatever genetic um, uh, company was. The thing is, like when we're when we're thinking about these things, we have to think about the abuse of power. Like if we're thinking about the systems that already exist, they're already racist and they're already biased. And so when you're introducing things like um, and extra, like the genetic testing and the reach of law enforcement into that, they're going to be used again to reinforce these systems that are already biased and already racist. So there will always be a reason or like um, like an explanation around um, we're pursuing a certain case, and in, in that in that particular case, they were going after murderer, right? No, it was Wasn't rapist. it rapist? Okay, uh, there's so many of them. Um, so that argument, that argument is one that's always going to pop up. We just have to remember that it doesn't really matter if it's a question of like the, um, the genetic testing or just the law enforcement investigating um, a crime now. Um, people of color are already at a disadvantage and we have been for, for years. So just that uh, advancement in technology still feeds into the same systems of power and racism. So that's, that's pretty much my take on it. Also, it's not that accurate. So, like, I get always like, I think you just get Africa. You don't get really much in between. But yeah, is there anything else? Um, just to, I want the the first two speakers to. Ex could you expand on um, how you're talking about subverting uh, surveillance? Um, so, a lot yesterday, someone spoke about surveillance, yeah. which I think was a term by Nina Brown. I think his uh, name Simone Brown. Simone Brown. Nina, where did that come from? Yeah, Simone Brown talked about surveillance. So, can you talk? Can you like expand a little bit more and like? how marginalized communities or the communities that are like uh, disadvantaged like because of these technologies, how are they subverting that? Um, first of all, everyone should read Simone Brown's book, Dark Matters. Uh, it's an amazing book. Um, and you know, actually it was really funny when um, I started to notice that Snapchat wasn't really working because I work in the field. I was like, hmm, I was like, maybe. It's not that bad. Like, like maybe, like you know, if there's like a video camera that has facial recognition technology, which a lot of video cameras do, like in certain places, that like it's not that bad that you don't know who I am. Um, and that's partially because of like Simone Brown's work about like surveillance and being able to subvert those systems. And I think that that's actually why I feel like we shouldn't be fighting to be included because I think that exactly what Simone Brown talks about about the fact that like you can subvert these systems whether you're trying or not trying just because of like them being inherently racist. Um, and so I think that when we talk about like, oh yeah, like we want this to be better, it takes away our power of subverting the system in itself, right? Because you're like, oh no, we want you to know us. Like we want you to know more information about us. We want you to see our faces. I think that there isn't, there are some really good examples by like Adam Harvey does really great work about like how you can subvert the system, like facial recognition cameras. And he said that actually now they've gotten quite powerful. So it's really hard for you to like, 
you know, make your face you, almost like ubiquitous. Like it's really hard for you to uh, mask it, but. Uh, there, I haven't had like any like direct examples of people doing like subverting systems right now. Like I'm not sure. Do you have any good examples? No, but thinking about thinking about uh, surveillance um, and basically switching the gaze from. We watch the launcher. Basically, we watch the launchers, which is what we do. Um, but something as simple as people recording the police, um, mm -hmm. and uh, whenever there's an incident. Uh, uh, something comes up, but basically putting back these tools into our hands and trying to 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 record or to surveil uh, or to watch the system um, by something as simple as you know uh, taping the police when when they're making an arrest or something like that. So just trying to think about the technologies that exist and um, using them instead for us as opposed to leaving them in the hands of the the powerful. And sometimes, like, I'm okay with something being racist and, like, letting that be, like, the thing. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm okay if you don't know who I am. Like, that's perfectly fine with me. Like, when you go through, like, um, when you go through customs, for example, like, the camera doesn't really work. And now they got really cool lighting situations, which is, like, slightly terrifying. I was like, oh, no, the lighting is so good now. You can recognize me. Um, and so I think that even though we try to fight back in, against, like, inherently racist um, systems, I think that's where I think Simone Brown's work and a lot of other folks work about, like, it's all good. Like, like we don't need to be included in all that stuff. It's really important for us. Okay, so sure, if yeah. you will hold the rest of your questions until after our last presenter, Dante, presents, that will be very much appreciated. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dante Newman. I'm a doctoral student in the School of Communication uh, at American University. Uh, the title of my project or presentation is uh, Straddling the Fence, How White Facebook Users Express Ambivalence to Multiple Audiences. Uh, so a white Facebook user posted this comment uh, in response to a news article about the Philando Castile police shooting. Uh, so please take a moment to read it. Okay, so later in the presentation, we will discuss how this comment uh, expresses ambivalence. So in light of a string of recent shootings, police brutality against black people has emerged as a contentious topic in national dialogue. One of the more polarizing police shootings is the Philando Castile incident. Philando Castile was fatally shot by Officer Geronimo Yanis during a traffic stop in Minnesota in July 2016. The aftermath of the police shooting was live streamed on Facebook by Philando's girlfriend, Diamond Reynolds. As reported by Diamond, Officer Yanis shot and killed Philando Castile while he was retrieving his license. Americans are profoundly polarized in their conversations about the police shooting of Philando Castile. In one corner, people condemn Officer Yanis and express support for Philando Castile. In the other corner, people criminalize Philando Castile and express support for Officer Yanis. Many of these conversations are taking place within Facebook. However, the technological architecture of Facebook may influence or shape how users are having these conversations about the police shooting of Philando Castile. For instance, the collapsing of social networks on Facebook may present impression management challenges for users in general, but white users in particular. In Facebook, different social groups with different expectations are integrated into a single network, which may problematize the ways in which white Facebook users respond to police shootings. As an example, white Facebook users may be expected to express support for Philando by one social group, which makes a moral claim. In contrast, white Facebook users may be expected to express support for law enforcement by another social group, which makes a normative claim. Choosing which claim to convey to overlapping Facebook to an overlapping Facebook audience may induce cognitive dissonance in white Facebook users, which may be reduced through ambivalent discourses. Ambivalence encompasses both moral and normative claims. And so moral claims are supportive of uh, black victims of police violence or Philando Castile, and normative claims are supportive of uh, law enforcement or the officer Geronimo Yanis who shot and killed Philando Castile. So to reduce this cognitive dissonance, why Facebook users may express ambivalence. So 
pretty much ambivalence encompasses both moral and normative claims. So using the police shooting of Philando Castile, I will explore how white Facebook users vacillate between moral and normative claims to simultaneously appeal to different social groups with different expectations. Next, I will provide a succinct overview of the theoretical frameworks of this study. So context collapse refers to a single network populated by distinct social groups. Cognitive dissonance refers to the psychological discomfort individuals may experience when having to uh, make a decision between two mutually exclusive alternatives. Uh, ambivalence refers to or contains contradictory discourses such as moral and normative claims. And ambivalence also functions to reduce cognitive dissonance. Impression management refers to the process by which people try to control how they are socially perceived by others. Uh, structure, uh, color blindness refers to the idea of um, ignoring or minimizing the, significant, uh, the significance of race. Structuration theory refers to the idea that agents and individuals uh, operate in tandem to reproduce social systems. So agents may refer to uh, individuals or groups, whereas structures may refer to rules and resources. So whiteness as structural refers to rules and resources of institutions, and whiteness as privilege refers to unearned advantages afforded by those structures. So here's the context of the study. So using the police shooting of Philando Castile, this study will examine how white Facebook users produce ambivalent discourses to reduce cognitive dissonance engendered by the context collapse. More explicitly, it will examine how moral claims may perform as an impression management tactic to present a non-racist identity and how white Facebook users may act as agents through normative claims that legitimize law enforcement to help protect structural whiteness and preserve white privilege. I employed a critical discourse analysis grounded in the interpretive community of critical whiteness theory to examine ambivalence. Uh, I analyzed over 3,000 comments and organized those comments into uh, frames as well as discursive patterns. Data were obtained from white Facebook users' comments in response to three news articles on Facebook that covered the Philando Castile shooting. Uh, these news organizations have news audiences that differ across the political spectrum. So CNN has a left-leaning news audience, ABC has a moderate news, a news audience, and Breitbart has a right-leaning news audience. And this is according, this is, uh, these results are according to a Pew Research Center study that was conducted in 2014. So drawing on a drawing on racial formation theory, white Facebook users, first I should say that Facebook does not ask you about your racial identity. And so in order to actually label someone as a white Facebook user, I had to kind of create a criteria to say this person is a white Facebook user and this person is a non-white Facebook user. And how I did this is was I, I drew on racial formation theory. And so I created a, a criteria based on uh, white physical features, white sounding name, and identity claim. So first, white physical features may include, but not limited to, blonde hair, blue eyes, light skin, which were observed or assessed by looking at uh, profile pictures and photo albums. Uh, white, uh, second, so drawing on a list of popular and distinct um, names given to white people, um, white male sounding names may include, but not limited to, Cody and Zachary, or Connor and Tanner. Uh, and white female sounding names or white women sounding names rather uh, may include Hannah and Emily. Uh, and third, identity claim uh, refers to statements that announce membership in the white racial group. So for instance, a comment may say as a white man or as a white woman. Uh, so it's, it's highly important to note that uh, Facebook users who possess or have white sounding uh, have a white sounding name or made an identity claim were not categorized as white Facebook users unless they possessed white physical features. That's important because my name could be Tanner, but I look but I look black and I am black. So just because you have a white sounding name or you made an identity claim, that does not mean you were categorized as a white Facebook user. You still had to possess white physical features. So it's like a triangulation. So let's quickly like analyze um, a comment, right? Uh, and this comment, again, was in response to a news article uh, on Facebook that covered the Philando Castile shooting. And I think we're talking about technology here, so it's important to note that this comment, um, this commenter has been given the pseudonym Dylan to protect uh, his or her uh, privacy. So let's critically analyze how this uh, white Facebook user uh, and, and expresses ambivalence. So first, Dylan constructs a non-racist identity 
through moral claims that condemn law enforcement for not only fatally shooting Philando Castile, but also how his girlfriend and daughter were subsequently treated. It's noteworthy that law enforcement is rendered invisible in his moral claims, um, which is problematic because anonymous perpetrators are impossible to hold accountable. He refers to police officers as they. Nonetheless, these moral claims may function as a, an impression management tactic to present or project a racially unprejudiced identity um, to, um, to a segment of his Facebook audience that may expect him to um, express support for black victims of police violence. Second, Dylan seamlessly transitions into normative claims to reduce cognitive dissonance by appealing to another segment of his Facebook population, which may expect him to defend law enforcement. Drawing from structuration theory, as an agent of structural whiteness, Dylan positions the crusade to eradicate systemic racism in policing as white hate. He views combating racial injustice as a personal attack because he cannot draw a distinction between his whiteness and the structures of law enforcement. As a white man, he sees himself as the structure, and any structural changes affect his doses of white privilege. So third, Dylan continues conveying normative claims through color blindness. He states, let me say right out the gate, this has nothing, exclamation point, right in all caps, to do with race, right? So the ideology of colorblindness functions to eliminate race from the fatal police encounter, which in turn uh, helps to protect structural whiteness from accusations of racism. So as an agent of law enforcement, Dylan employs colorblind discourse to not only help legitimize the police shooting of Philando Castile, but also as an impression management tactic to control how law enforcement is socially perceived. So fourth, Dylan continues expressing normative claims by reducing systemic racialized police violence uh, to just a scared, trigger-happy cop. This narrative is dangerous because it may function to legitimize the devaluation of black bodies based on an unsubstantiated fear of black men and women. Fifth, Dylan continues conveying normative claims by delegitimizing the Black Lives Matter movement and the Black Panther Party as hate groups. This normative argument is life-threatening for Black Lives Matter activists as leaders of the Black Panther Party were assassinated by local police departments in conjunction with the FBI. Sixth, Dylan still trying to reduce cognitive dissonance produced by the context collapse concludes by reconstructing his non-racist identity through moral claims. He refers to the police shooting of Philando Castile as tragic and hold the police officer Geronimo Yanis as quasi accountable uh, by stating that it doesn't look good on the cop's part. So in conclusion, this comment shows how white Facebook users may convey ambivalence to reduce cognitive dissonance produced by the context collapse. These ambivalent discourses produced by the context collapse um, and contain moral claims which express support for Philando or black victims of police violence in general and normative claims which express support uh, for law enforcement uh, and uh, or Officer Geronimo Yanis. So discursive ambivalence is one way white Facebook users may meet the different expectations of different social groups who are collapsed into a single network. However, ambivalence may not only function to reduce cognitive dissonance, but also as an impression management tactic. Moral claims may function as an impression management tactic to enable white Facebook users to present this non-racist identity by expressing sympathy for Philando Castile, while simultaneously working as an agent of law enforcement to help legitimize the police shooting through normative claims. And so patterns in the discourse of white Facebook users uh, give this, uh, may give this um, assessment or theory some credibility. I find that white Facebook users construct ambivalence in three ways. And so for example, a comment may begin with a moral claim and then it concludes with a host of normative claims. Uh, second, it may begin with a moral claim followed by a host of normative claims and then conclude with a moral claim. And uh, third, the comment may begin with a moral claim followed by a host of normative claims then followed by a single moral claim and then conclude with a, a host of normative claims. And so let's, and it goes on. So let's see how pattern number three uh, is constructed in, in practice. All right, so this is by another white Facebook user who shall rename nameless. Uh, and so let's just quickly, two minutes. So I have two minutes, so let's quickly run through this. And so I agree that, uh, that there are some, and I'm going to read it as is. So I agree that there are some bad police officers out there, right? That's a moral claim uh, because it, takes, uh, it indirectly takes a position against police officers. And so but by, but by the statistics, blacks being killed by white cops is small compared to black on black, that's just crime, right? We know black on black crime is not a thing because 
white on white crime is not a thing. Latinx against Latinx crime is not a thing. We know that people tend to kill people uh, who live in, the, in close proximity. So it's just not a thing. So that's definitely a normative claim. So, uh, but don't, but I don't hear people talking about that. Man, everyone talks about black on black crime, right? So do not believe, <laughs> say, do not blame all police officers for the actions of a few. And then we see here that he's reducing systemic police violent, violence to a few bad apples, right? And then it's say, like, it is hard job for them. Well, it's hard being black. Right? And it's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see any of the haters taking, when you say haters, you mean black people, right? Black, black social justice warriors. So, but, but that's, okay. I, and it's for, I don't have much time. So taking these jobs to change. And so, and what about the statistics of police officers hurt or killed by the criminals of all colors? Now let's, let's get this clear right now. Police officers are more likely to be shot and killed by a white man. And it's talking about of all colors, but we know we, that's an impression management tactic there. And then he said, or is that okay? No one ever said it was okay. So everyone, here, so everyone here is a hypocrite and has no solution for a small problem. Really? Police brutality is a small problem when like thousands of people are killed every year uh, you know, at the hands of police officers. And then he says, yes, there is racism in America. Okay, yes, that's a moral claim, right? Can we say that's a, that's a moral claim? Yes. Again, that's another impression management tactic because watch what he does after this. Mainly by the news media and so much from the poor, uneducated people of all races. Now he's just talking about all races. Oh, let's keep on reading. So people need to take some responsibility for their own actions. Now we know, all right, so people need to take responsibility for their own actions and for how their lives have turned out. Now, we know that this is universalist, meritocratic rhetoric that's always telling black people to pull themselves up by the bootstraps, right? But we never hear about this when we're talking about like the white working class who are struggling because coal is no longer here. It's always black people, pull yourselves up by the bootstraps. So we know that this is colorblind, uh, meritocratic rhetoric that is aimed specifically at black people. Right, so it's basically victim blaming. And then we hear is stop blaming others for your circumstances. So it just concludes with, so you can see the third pattern. It opens up with a, a single moral claim and it's followed by a multitude of uh, normative claims. And then you get that single moral claim again, yes, there's racism in America. And then it concludes again with a host of normative claims. And I wish I can go through all of the patterns here, but for sake of time, I'll just do that one. And so this, I should say that this, this, um, this uh, presentation is part of a larger study. It's part of my uh, dissertation where I examine how um, uh, how white Facebook users not only express ambivalence um, following the police shooting of Philando Castile, but also following the indictment and acquittal of uh, Geronimo Yanis. And so if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to talk to me afterwards. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And if we could have all of our panelists come and sit up at the front. Um, and we can proceed with our questions. I'm sure there are many. I see some hands up in the back. Hi, thank you. Um, this is a question about this presentation. Um, the differentiation between moral and normative claims, I'm wondering what led you to, ch to consider the normative claims normative um, when you could also consider them moral just on a different spectrum. Because um, often the terminology of like, self-respectability, yourself, pull yourselves up by the bootstraps, is in, in essence the idea of moralism as being self-responsibility. Um, so I'm wondering if you thought about that in differentiating between moral and uh, normative, and if so, what led you to give those two differentiations? Yeah, and to be quite honest with you, it was, it was definitely my dissertation uh, chair's um, uh, recommendation. He was like, you should definitely call this moral claim and definitely call this a normative claim. But the reality is, does it matter what we call it? It's there. It's there. What, we, could, we could say that, I could easily say that if you support police officers, then it's a moral claim. Nonetheless, you still have that ambivalence where a white person on Facebook is, is you know, wavering between support for uh, black victims of police violence and support for law enforcement officers. So I think, I think we could, I mean, we, can, we could call it anything. I could change it from ambivalence and name it contradictions, right? You know, where it's just like, oh, it's not his fault. You know, where you may get a comment that says, Philando Castile shouldn't have died. But, we, but also, it's not, the, it's not the officer's fault. You know, yeah? That's like, I mean, it, you could, you could, we can call it anything. It could be like ethical claim, or I don't know. You, you can call it anything, but the most important thing is there is a social phenomenon. And whatever we name that social phenomenon, as long as we're able to say, look, this thing exists. You know, and, and, and this, I mean, and, and actually like in the literature, uh, about you know like white what they call like white race discourse I don't call it that and I just call it ambivalence uh, but you still you you uh, you still um, see uh, where 
these sort of claims that express support, like for example, like I support affirmative action, but I also don't think that black people are, are or women should be, you know, uh, allowed into these schools if they don't meet requirements, right? It's just kind of like, dang, what do you call that? I mean, you can call that anything, but as long as you acknowledge that it's there, yeah. Uh, other questions? You have a question here. Uh, I have a question for you, Dante. Okay, he so, knows me uh, personally. <laughs> So, um, like in the way that you laid out how white people kind of lay out their arguments, we know that this kind of permeates like all levels of society and so all forms of communication. So, what about Facebook specifically? Like, why'd you lay it out in the format of Facebook and not like we know it's in the general media? For we sure, you can talk about it for sure. Person, so. Absolutely, I mean that's that's a really good question, Demariano Hill. <laughs> Yeah, well, you, you, you call me by my first name and call you by your first and last name. That's how we're going. No, but I, I think that's a really good question, uh, DJ. Uh, 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 so I think there are several reasons why I chose Facebook. Uh, so first, Facebook has a real, and you guys did a really good job too, I'd like to say that. So first, Facebook has a, a, a real name policy, right, where in order to sign up for Facebook, you must you must submit, like, and now, I, don't, I think probably everyone in this room has created a Facebook before, like 2014, but now if you create a Facebook account, I believe you have to submit like a, some form of, a, of a, a government issued ID to, so you can verify you are who you say you are, right? And so if that being the case, we know if you're on Facebook and you have a picture uh, of uh, and you're and you're white and you have a picture of like white kids running around in the yard, then you're probably a white person. Whereas on whereas on Twitter, no seriously, whereas on Twitter you don't. Uh, people have like these avatars and they have like kittens and stuff like that and as an avatar. So like trying to do this uh, and then also that's another thing is uh, on Facebook the the character limit. No one in this room knows how many characters are allowed on Facebook. If someone has that answer, like I'm, I'll be very impressed. But we know how many characters are allowed on Twitter. It was like 140 at the time I did this study, but now it's 280. But so imagine trying to do this study on Twitter with 140 characters. There's no way I would be able to get those patterns, right? Because you won't see how people waver between the moral and normative claims because it's just not enough space for them to do so. But how many of you have ever looked at a comment on Facebook like, oh, this is just too long, I'm not gonna read it. Yeah. Exactly. So when I'm when I'm looking at those responses and I'm looking at those responses, I mean those comments in response to news articles, I'm actually looking at it and I'm excited to like look at oh man, this is interesting. Moral claim, normative claim, normative claim, moral claim. Oh my gosh. So like I'm really so that's why that's one of the reasons why I chose Facebook. Uh, and then also on Facebook, um, I think you it's um oh, and another another reason why I chose Facebook too is this it, like it goes along with what I said earlier, like how do we identify I'm a t I'll tell you guys this. I'm sorry. I, it's no, my. So, man, I had I had a, I had a white professor, a white sociologist. She called me racist, right? She said, this was uh, last semester. She said, you're racist because there's no such thing as a white sounding name. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> I said, oh, really? She's like, she literally, I, I gave this presentation in her class. She's like, oh, man, you're racist. And I was like, oh, really? So I was like, and then she was just like, so I was just like, she's like, you're racist because how are you going to identify uh, white people on Facebook? Well, I said, have you heard of black Twitter? She's like, yeah. I said, does Twitter ask you about your racial identity? And she said, no. And she said, well, I don't know. I said, it doesn't. So how do we know about black Twitter if Twitter doesn't ask you about your racial identity? So we have to stop with the colorblind politics. And, then, and so that, that's, that goes along with Facebook. You are who you say you are 95% of the time on Facebook. It's, it, it's, 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 it's a di Facebook has a different culture than Twitter. Like I have like five Twitter accounts, but I have one Facebook account. You know, and so of course there's there's room and space to misidentify people, and I discussed that in the limitations. Um, but we can look in this room right now and say, okay, if you look to the left of you, you look to the right of you, you can say, okay, to the left of me there's a white person, to the right of me there's probably a black person. So let's stop playing the colorblind game and stop saying that we can't identify people when we can with like 90% accuracy. Like no one in this room would label me white, and if you do, that's a problem. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and on top of that, um, Facebook now with their like affinity groups or whatever they're calling Absolutely. it is automatically labeling you whether or not you self-identify. So based on the patterns of things that you're posting, that your friends are posting to you, the things that you're sharing, they're going to tell you whether or not you're conservative or liberal, yeah. whether or not you're black, white, Latino, or Asian. Um, so there's definitely some validity in terms of if the algorithms can do it, then surely we can do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And, and yeah, go ahead. Um, oh, I'll use this. 
Um, so have you tested, like, you have those different patterns. Have you tested it on, like, public forums? Because, like, it's the same thing, but it's not, I guess it's the same thing in regards to comments and, like, you know, you have, like, you don't have necessarily, like, limitations, but have you tried to test it out on different forums to see if you have the same kind of conversations that people have? Do you mean, like, public forums, like, comments under, like, a CNN news article on this website? Yeah, it could be, like, news articles, but over, like, Reddit, too. Like, for example, like, so, for example, like, Reddit threads. But I assume that the reason why you did a social media platform is because it's, like, the person in their community, but, like, or how they comment on different things. But, I like, I wonder, have you tried to test out your claim on, like, Reddit or, like, other platforms like Reddit and news sites? No, I have not, uh, and, and the reason is because uh, Reddit is, um, the thing is with Reddit is it's not a social platform where you may have, where the, where the context collapse may occur, right? Where you may have like, how many of you follow like people from your, like coworkers, right? And, then, and, and by show of hands, how many of you follow like coworkers? Right? Aren't you kind of like skeptical of posting certain things because all oh, my coworkers may see this, but you also want to post it because your friends may like may expect for you to post something like that. I don't I don't know if that occurs on Reddit, and if it does, to what degree it occurs, I'm not sure. But I think that would be interesting to see like do these patterns emerge? And I'll be honest with you, I did when I when I this study emerged from a, a project that I conducted in the summer of last year, where I was looking at um, uh, Breitbart comments on the actual website. But everything was just normative claims, or just like basically supportive of law enforcement. And so, but on Facebook, when I looked at that same article, the comments, you, you could see that the right-leaning news audiences were vacillating, you know, just moral claim. I support Philando Castile. I, he shouldn't have died. He was a great man. But we should not punish all law enforcement officers. You know, so like, I don't know if that would occur on, on Reddit. And if I do, then I would have to change my theoretical framework. Yeah. I don't know you, so I'll call you Mr. Newman, I guess. Uh, uh, so go going off what you just said in yeah. terms of the, the theoretical framework you're using in terms of uh, with regard to uh, context collapse and such, like the, the kind of comments that you illustrated and that we all see here and there very much mirror my experience speaking with other white people about this topic and other things around race where uh, I'm not even sure if they have a, you know, uh, you know, theoretical framework about how they're addressing these things, but there is always uh, uh, degrees of ambivalence going back and forth, sure. even among their own peer group. And For so uh, to a certain extent, I don't know if that's happening because I'm talking to them and I'm presenting a very, um, uh, 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 very non-normative uh, uh, storyline, so to speak, or if it's something that is sort of part of uh, sort of white respectability politics where like there are certain there are certain things that you have to uh, boxes you have to check off in terms of decrying racism uh, sort of nominally but then going forth with various normative claims yeah I, and, I'll, and I'll tell you this in, in response to your comment this study looking at ambivalence as if you want to call ambivalence moral and normative claims a ma a, my next study if anyone wants to help me with this will be looking at how men respond to Me Too movement. Wow. You know, I've been in conversations, I've had conversations with men and they'll be like, you know, I, I don't, you know, I support those women, but I don't think that we should, the, Russell Simmons should be fired for it. How do you, like, you know, so it's like one of those things where like, even men do it as well. Like, you know, and not to take the conversation about men, not to take the conversation away from white people, but I think that you, <laughs> you know, I think that, no, seriously, but I think that you, what I'm trying to say is that these patterns are something that you may experience whenever you have um, individuals who are, or groups of people wherever in positions of power. And because men, we live in this patriarchal, male-dominated society, we have to protect that, we have to protect this patriarchal system by using ambivalence. Like, we don't want to come out like, um, like, I just don't believe those women at all. But we're going to do, we're going to protect it in an ambivalent way. And we have to understand that discourse is intertwined with, with structures, right? And so if we are ambivalent about, you know, police brutality, and we know that political officials are champions of public issues, then they won't do anything about it, right? Because everyone is ambivalent about it. We're lukewarm about it. And so 
that's why, and that's, and, and I didn't really explain. I'm on a man. I'm on my soapbox up here. I waited. All right, we got we got some time, right, April? We have ten minutes. Okay. And a few more. And a few no, more I won't. I I'm not gonna do that. All right. But anyway, I was gonna say like, uh, you know, to answer your question, I, and I guess that's like one of the reasons why I think in 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 the previous conference someone asked, well, why why didn't you focus on like black people and Latinx people? Is because we're not in positions of power, right? And we and especially when it comes to 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 local law enforcement. Right, white people occupy 75% of local, um, you know, local en enforcement officials. Right, and so white people are in position to, uh, or at least to help to uh, eradicate uh, or police violence to the extent that it's addressable through uh, policy, hiring, and enforcement. Um, that ambivalence, by the way, also works when you're talking about technology and whether it should exist, like that certain tools should exist or not. People are always like, mm, but like, for example, predictive policing, I remember someone having a conversation about it and they were like, well, like, wouldn't it make it just like cheaper? Cause like you could just easily quickly know if someone should get bail or not. And you don't have to go through this entire process instead of being like, no, that actually shouldn't exist at all. So I think that that stuff actually currently happens when we're talking about like AI for good, where you're talking about tech for good stuff. It's like, you know, you're like, mm, like, it's not that bad. Like, it's okay. Like, we know it's a problem, but like, we'll be able to like fix some parts of it. And I'm like, no, actually, like, you can just shut it down. So, you know, like, I think that's often, that exists also in our everyday lives, right? Like, it's like, and, and I think that it exists in the tools that we create. It's an exists in like the systems that we're currently in. And so I think it's important to recognize that as well. It's not just the claims on Facebook. It's like when we're justifying the tools that we've created. Uh, hi, um, I have a question towards Sarah Nasma's um, presentation about solutionism. Um, so just like, you know, being in this industry and in this field, there is this like moralization of solutionism and interventionism that I've been struggling a lot with, especially in academia. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, I think in my dissertation, in my research, I'm going to be calling for a lot of separationist tools um, that if I work in international development and statistics. So I think that African people should be able to measure African statistics as they want. Um, so I was wondering, I feel like the conversation is changing away from this moralization of so technological solutions. Uh, we should include people in these surveillance systems. And I feel like the conversation is moving away from that. I was wondering what what you all think, like being practitioners, being researchers in this field, what is the future of this technological separation in a way of us building our own tools and us building our own morals in these systems? That's a solid question. Um, uh, yeah, so first like fuck tech solutionism, like completely, um, techno solutionism and I don't know, I think about that a lot actually. I almost studied international development and then I ended up studying public policy. And I remember when I got back into like the tech space, I was like, holy crap, it's like internet freedom world kind of reminds me of international development. Um, and so I think that the future looks the future looks bright, and the reason why I say that is because people are creating like decentralized systems and localized systems. And so, like a really great example, I'm from Toronto, so this is like very Toronto content. But um, like there is like there's a land trust right now issue um, in Toronto, and they don't have data to like fight back against it, or like you know be able to make claims for like community, um, make claims for the different things that they wanted. And so they actually started collecting data in their own community, and like they have that localized, and they have it protected within their own community. And so I think that there's more and more examples of people creating decentralized systems. That doesn't necessarily mean that like I have to be from Toronto and like coming to another country to like help them set up their infrastructure or anything like that. So I think that there's more and more push for decentralization and localization, and I think that that's the future in many ways. Like I don't believe in like the larger conglomerate, like large monopolies, and so I think that you know if you think about like mesh networks, for example. Um, and just also like indigenous communities also collecting data within their own communities um, and not sharing it or choosing when to share it, I think is really important for us to think about. Um, and so I, I think I think I think there is a future there, but we just have to 
we have to also allow and support for that to occur because I think it's the funding issue is also a huge thing is that a lot of the funding is for like international like larger projects and not local projects um, and not local uh, decentralized projects and so I think it's also we have to understand the ways in which capital plays a huge role and why there are larger systems and not like tiny mini microsystems. But Sarah probably has a huge point yeah. about that. No, I was going to say the same thing that you did, um, especially when it comes to um, to funding and actually supporting these uh, initiatives, because they are happening uh, for yeah. us to create tools for us by us, as opposed to having. I mean, f for me specifically, I'm from Lebanon, so I grew up in the Middle East, and I've seen so many big tech companies from the U.S. or from Europe uh, introduce tech solutions into our communities. Um, and they're being developed by people who are not from the community, people who are not us, people who live in a different country as well. Um, and it never, it never really works out. Um, and for in the field that I work in, which is data privacy and data security, a lot of the tools that are being used in the Middle East to circumvent, uh, say, government surveillance are being developed uh, in the US. Something as simple as Signal has a, do people know what Signal is? It's a it's an applica um, messaging application like WhatsApp, and it's being developed here in the US. Um, but then when you go to the Middle East and you try to use it there, and it's an encrypted platform where you can exchange text messages with someone else uh, and not be, and if those text messages are intercepted by someone, <clears throat> the text messages are actually encrypted. Uh, so it really helps with things like government surveillance, uh, where the government can actually read the messages that are being exchanged by people. But for a tool like Signal, um, which is really the like one of the best messaging tools that you could be using. Uh, when you are trying to use that in the Middle East, um, the 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 internet speed is literally just not fast enough, and signal doesn't work. Um, so these tools are also being developed in countries where um, that just have a different broadband, like bandwidth for for the internet. So there's so many, so many, so many groups and so many. Um, uh, so many folks in the Middle East and uh, elsewhere in the world or different communities that are trying to develop these tools and that are trying to, to create these systems. Um, but we see the same folks being funded and being supported over and over again. Um, and it really, I think we just need to start shifting the conversation even in terms of funding and in terms of uh, like supporting folks uh, away from just the big, the big companies that we always, that we know and that we supposedly trust. Um, and that are pretty famous in their field, but really just shifting um, and helping folks from the ground up. Yeah, because it's like well. really white savior complex stuff that's going on right now in the tech space. So it's important to recognize that. Um, so this is a question for Dante. Um, you mentioned that you had, you, you might, it's a practical question, so I'm sorry, it's probably very boring. Um, you mentioned that you mined about 3,800 comments, was that correct? Yes. Yeah. Either. So that's a lot of comments. Mm -hmm. um, practically, did you use any automation to tag them? And if you did, how did that, how does that play into what we've just spoken about today about the dangers of automatically giving things labels? And I'd be interested to know how you kind of went about the whole process because it's quite a big undertaking. Yeah, at, yeah. So again, my, my dissertation is comprised uh, of three stages, and so the first stage is the the shooting of Philando Castile, and the second and third stages are the indictment uh, and acquittal of Officer Geronimo Yanis, who shot and killed um, uh, Philando Castile. And so in total, it's a, it's close to ten thousand comments. But uh, I had conversations with my good friend here, DeQuaylin. And he's been like, yo, you should definitely use in vivo. My professors, uh, people, even professors on my committee were saying you should definitely use in vivo because you're dealing with a large data set. And I was opposed to that because I wanted to go through all of those comments and, uh, and identify patterns. And I did not want to rely on in vivo to um, identify ambivalence. I'm, I want to say what's ambivalence. I don't want, even though when you, people think that you, you can, oh, you can tell in vivo what to do, but there's too much room for error. Especially when you're dealing with ambivalence and you're, and, and you're typing things like, um, you know, murder and these cold words for support for, uh, for vic victims, of, black victims of police violence. I did not want to leave that up to in vivo to tell me what was ambivalence. And I'll tell you this, it was definitely an undertaking, uh, but there, so there were three articles in each stage, right? So there are nine articles in total. So what I did was, and keep in mind that some articles, uh, some, um, when you think about it, I analyzed 3,000 comments, uh, but I should say there were 3,000 comments in total, but there were like 2,500 from white Facebook users, right? And then some of the, um, some of the comments were one word, sad. Shouldn't have happened, right? So you can, you can blow through that, 
You know what I mean? So like, I, I think I analyzed like comments. It took me like maybe two days for each news um, article. So it didn't take it didn't take long at all. So yeah, yeah. We have time for one more question. Hi, this question is for Julia. Um, I just, I think you're redefining sexual assault and violence, contextualizing it um, and making it stopping, or stopping it from being non-linear is really important. And so that's good and kind of moving forward and redefining things, but in terms of getting justice or how it looks like in the legal system, how do you, with these new definitions, um, apply that so that we can now figure out how to get justice in these smaller, redefined definitions of what violence means, what sexual assault means. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, that was also something I've been thinking about with you guys talking about ambivalence as something that is working often to maintain hierarchies and maintain white supremacy in these white Facebook users' comments, whereas I had been talking about spaces of ambiguity as important to hold and allow for in a diff in a very different way. But I'm wondering, there, and, so, and also when you code ambivalence, that's kind of a previous question, when you start to code it, you are putting it out of its ambivalent state and into the C or the, you know, putting it into a code which is not ambivalent in its nature. Um, which can then be used to potentially target or in negative way, possibly by structures. So, I mean, I was thinking in a more radical sense of allowing that to like the expansion of the carceral state would want legal, easily definable legal definitions of what counts as assault. And that maybe isn't the way to go for thinking about restorative justice and thinking about community-based, um, like working through these issues. So it wouldn't be, the legal system doesn't allow for that, but I think maybe with our current legal system that that would be okay. Yeah. Oh, I think we're out of time. Uh, can we give our panelists one more round of applause? Thank you so much for all of your presentations and thank you all for joining us.